Hello everyone. Let's continue with the last subtopic of Chapter 2, Cell Structures and Functions. 2.4 Cell Transport A. Overview of the various transport mechanisms across the membrane. B. Explain the various transport mechanism across the membrane 1. Passive transport, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion and osmosis. 2. Active transport, sodium-potassium pump and bulk transport, endocytosis and exocytosis. Transport across membrane is a process to move substances across the cell membrane which is essential to the life of the cell. Example is gaseous exchange that occurs in the alveoli. Plasma membrane regulates the passage of molecules into and out of the cell. This enables a cell to control substances and how much of each enters or leaves the cell. Plasma membrane is selectively permeable that only allows some material to pass through while inhibits passage of other materials. There are two types of cell transport which are passive and active transport. Passive transport is divided into simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion and osmosis. While active transport involves sodium-potassium pump and bulk transport. Bulk transport is further divided into endocytosis and exocytosis. Let's look at the first type of transport, passive transport. Passive transport involves movement of substances from an area of high concentration to low concentration area or down concentration gradients until an equilibrium is achieved. This process does not require cellular energy, ADP. As stated before, there are three types of passive transport which are simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion and osmosis. Simple diffusion involves diffusion of solute directly through phospholipid bilayer to move across a plasma membrane. Example of solutes or molecules that can pass through the plasma membrane are lipid-soluble molecules, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Passive transport is the movement of substances into or out of a cell without the expenditure of energy by the cell. One form of passive transport is diffusion. During diffusion, molecules move across a membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. The molecules are therefore said to be moving down a concentration gradient. This continues until equilibrium is reached and the molecules are distributed equally. Facilitated diffusion involves carrier-assisted diffusion of molecules across a cell membrane through specific channels from a region of higher concentration to lower concentration. This process requires the help of carrier proteins and protein channels. Example of molecules are glucose, fructose, amino acids, and urea. Another form of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. 
Facilitated diffusion occurs when an ion or molecule diffuses across a membrane faster than expected, either by way of a specific channel protein or with the assistance of carrier proteins that change shape as they pass through. There are two classes of membrane transport proteins which are carrier and protein channels. Both form continuous protein pathways across the lipid bilayer. Protein channels have a tunnel that allow movement of ions or charged molecules to move in or out of the cell. Example is chloride ion. Carrier proteins bind to molecule and change their shape to move specific molecules in or out of the cell. Example is glucose. Osmosis involves the movement of water molecules across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of higher water potential to lower water potential. Unit of water potential is kilopascal, kPa. Pure water has the highest water potential which is 0 kPa. This is because pure water contains only water molecules, without any solutes. So all water molecules can move freely with highest free energy. When solutes are added, water molecules will bind to the solutes to dissolve it. Water molecules can no longer move freely, thus lowering its free energy. This will cause the water potential to decrease and become more negative. The diffusion of water across a membrane, or osmosis, is another example of passive transport. In many cases, specialized proteins called aquaporins allow for the more rapid transport of water molecules. <laughs> Before we take a look at how osmosis and tonicity affect a cell, let's review what each of these terms means. Osmosis represents the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. The term tonicity refers to the relative solute concentration of two environments separated by a semi-permeable membrane. In other words, by comparing the tonicity of the solutions, you can determine the direction in which osmosis will occur. To demonstrate how tonicity affects a cell, let's place some red blood cells into a beaker containing pure water. In this case, the solute concentration is greater inside the cells than in the surrounding water. In other words, the contents of the cells are hypertonic in relation to the hypotonic contents of the beaker. Because of this, osmotic pressure results in the diffusion of water across the membrane and into the cells. Over time, if enough water enters the cells, the cell membranes may burst. This is called lysis. Now let's place the red blood cells in a beaker containing a solution of salt, such as sodium chloride. Since the contents of the beaker are hypertonic in relation to the interior of the cells, the water within the cells will diffuse across the membrane and into the contents of the beaker. This causes crenation, or shrinking, of the cells. If the red blood cells are placed in a beaker whose contents match the tonicity within the cells, then there is no net gain or loss of water. The environments within the beaker and inside the cells are said to be isotonic or the same. An important thing to remember is that osmotic pressure always causes water to move from a hypotonic environment toward a hypertonic environment. In other words, water moves toward areas of high salt or sugar concentrations. This simple process is used to drive the operation of our kidneys and explains some of the physiological consequences of diseases such as diabetes. Active transport is the movement of ions or molecules across a membrane from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration or against concentration gradient. 
This process involves sodium potassium pump and bulk transport. Sodium potassium pump regulates the movement of sodium and potassium ions through the cells. While, bulk transport involves the transport of materials that are too large to move with membrane proteins and must be transported across membranes using vesicles. Active transport is a type of cell transport that requires the input of energy in the form of ATP. The proteins that conduct this form of transport are often called pumps because they force molecules or ions to move from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. This is commonly referred to as against the concentration gradient. One of the more common examples of active transport is the sodium potassium pump. The job of the sodium potassium pump is to move sodium ions, or Na+, out of the cell, and potassium ions, or K+, into the cell. Let's take a closer look at how this happens. The sodium potassium pump has binding sites for three sodium and two potassium ions. Let's follow the movement of the sodium ions first. After three sodium ions are positioned within the carrier protein, an ATP molecule is split, releasing phosphate. This phosphate binds to a location on the exterior of the carrier protein, causing the protein to change shape. As the protein changes shape, the three sodium ions are released to the other side of the membrane. Next, two potassium ions position themselves within the carrier protein, causing it to undergo another change in shape. In the process, the phosphate molecule is released. Once the phosphate molecule is released, the carrier protein expels the potassium ions into the interior of the cell. The carrier then resumes its initial shape, completing the cycle. Notice that for every three sodium ions leaving the cell, two potassium ions enter. Since both sodium and potassium ions have a positive charge, this unequal movement causes an electrical gradient to develop across the plasma membrane of the cell. A number of cellular processes, including the generation of nerve impulses, use this electrical gradient. There are two types of bulk transport which are endocytosis and exocytosis. Exocytosis is cellular secretion of biological molecules by the fusion of vesicles containing them with the plasma membrane. Endocytosis is cellular uptake of biological molecules and particulate matter via formation of vesicles from the plasma membrane. There are two types of endocytosis which are pinocytosis and phagocytosis. Pinocytosis involves the uptake of liquid or dissolved materials into the cell, while phagocytosis involves the uptake of large solid particles into the cell. Bulk transport is used for molecules that are too large to be moved by transport proteins. Instead, vesicles take them into or out of the cell. During this process, the plasma membrane surrounds and engulfs the particle. This is known as endocytosis. Cells use three basic types of endocytosis, depending on the size and nature of the material to be digested. Phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. If the material taken in is large, such as bacteria or a food particle, the process is called phagocytosis. Pinocytosis occurs when vesicles form around a liquid or very small particles. Exocytosis is the opposite of endocytosis. During exocytosis, membrane-bound vesicles move to the surface of the plasma membrane, fuse with the membrane, and then release their contents to the outside of the cell. <laughs> 